Our next speaker is Professor Anthony Cochrane, who is Ireland's leading EU critical campaigner. Uh, many of you will remember the work and organisation that he's put into the various referendum campaigns in, in the Republic of Ireland, for which we are uh, truly grateful. Um, he's the director of the Dublin-based National Platform for EU Research, which campaigns against the EU and for a Europe of independent, democratic, operating nation-states. He's also a senior lecturer emeritus in social policy at Trinity College Dublin, and through his involvement in TEAM, the European Alliance of EU Critical Movements, Professor Cochrane is well known and respected across the continent. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Anthony Cochrane. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I, I'm very honoured to be here today uh, and um, I've had a long in connection with the British Eurocritical Movement. I recall way back in 1975 when uh, you have a referendum of whether you'd stay in the EEC or not, speaking at a meeting in the Beaver Hall in East London with Richard Body on one side and Peter Shore on the other, and the late Peter Shore on the other. So it's very good to have Democrats in different countries getting together in what effectively is an international campaign in defense of the nation state. Personally, I, I'm a happy man these days. I, as a, all my adult life, or virtually all my adult life, I've been campaigning against uh, European integration, and particularly against the Euro, when, once it came on, uh, on the field, on general democratic grounds. I have no party political affiliations and haven't had for decades. But as a Democrat uh, and an internationalist, I'm against uh, this, uh, this project, which is fundamentally one of seeking to subvert national democracy and national independence. Of course, the EU and the Eurozone are essentially political creations. Christopher Booker, in his wonderful book, The Great Deception, described how the um, first steps towards supranational integration, the Cold and Steel Community of 1950-51, was to reconcile France to German rearmament in the context of the early stages of the Cold War at that time. That was the first step towards supranationalism, pushed by the Americans at the time. The formation of the Euro was to reconcile France to German reunification uh, after 1989-90 and the collapse in Eastern Europe. So political motivations have been fundamental between the so-called Franco-German couple in the context of uh, Maastricht and the single currency, it was monetary union for political union. Or put more crudely, the Deutsche Mark for the Euro bomb. Because of course, uh, France has the nuclear weapon, which the Germans haven't. But if you've got a European kind of set up, a European security policy, the Germans might get their finger in that way on the nuclear trigger. So that was part of the thinking behind Maastricht and behind the Franco-German Brigade, which was set up at the time, and which is still in existence with joint officers and so on. Prodi, the former commission president, said some years ago, the two pillars of the nation state are the sword and the currency, and we have changed that. Indicating clearly the kind of uh, mentality and orientation that the top bureaucrats uh, have. As was indicated by Mr. Glynn this morning, uh, the world has seen many examples of monetary unions collapse the last 20 years in Europe. You've had the disappearance of the USSR ruble. Where now is the ruble? Where is the Czechoslovak crown? Where are the Yugoslav dina, which are currencies that have been in existence for 70 or 80 years in political unions and fiscal unions, which, which of course have, have gone into history? Where is the Austro-Hungarian thaler? Gone. And that of course would happen in due time with, with, with the euro. The Republic of Ireland uh, was, was uh, of course, a part of the United Kingdom Monetary Union for most of the 19th century and into up to 1921 when the United States was established. At that time, Britain was the workshop of the world, and Ireland, or the south of Ireland, became an agricultural backwater. And many economists would argue that really it had an implicitly uh, wrong or overvalued currency by being part of the, uh, of the sterling area at that time. When the United States was established, we, we did our trade overwhelmingly with Britain, nearly 90% of it at the time, in the 20s and 30s. And uh, between 1921 and 1979, 
The Irish currency was kept at par with the pound sterling. Many of you would remember that. The Irish pound and the British pound exchange at par, the Irish shilling, the British shilling. And again, some economists would argue that that was probably an overvalued exchange, implicitly overvalued exchange rate for the Republic at the time, of the South of Ireland at the time. And we could have done with, uh, with a more independent currency. Which, but uh, we did break the link with sterling in 1979. But instead, as preparation, joined the European monetary system uh, as part of the preparation, the long-term preparation for, for the establishment of a European single currency. Because you must know that the political elite, the senior civil service, the main political parties in the Republic of Ireland are really ultra unified if not euro fanatical most of them. But the things are beginning to change now. We did break the link with starting in 79 and linked to the uh, Deutsche Mark effectively through the EMS, as did Britain after some years. And you remember that that system broke asunder in the great devaluation crisis of 1993. That Wednesday, or some would call it Golden Wednesday, when you left the ERM, it did damage the Conservative Party, but it was very good for the, for, for the British economy. Ireland, or the Republic of Ireland, with the usual uncritical europhilia of its uh, the economic leaders decided to try and stick with the ERM when the British left it. The British left it in September 92. The Irish stayed linked to the Deutsche Mark and the other currencies of the ERM. And in January 93, the Irish punt was one tenth more valuable than the British pound. It was 110 pence sterling. One tenth more valuable. Of course, we do a third of our trade with Britain and the, the, the uh, and uh, this was hitting our exports hugely, all hell broke loose, it was an unsustainable exchange rate, an overvalued currency, and we devalued the Irish pound from 110 pence sterling to 100 pence sterling, and let it flow down in the next seven years. It had a similar devaluation against the dollar. The devaluation did a great good to the British economy, you left this crude link to the Deutsche Mark. It did even more superlative good to the Irish economy. Because in the year that we broke away from the ERM and devalued the currency and let it effectively float, you had a 6% growth rate, that was 93.4. Between 1993.4 and the end of the decade, 1999-2000, the average Irish economic growth rate per year was nearly 8%, which means a doubling of your output in nine years. In 8%, well over double what had been traditionally average 3 or 4% a year in the 60s, 70s and 80s, but the period 93.4 and 2000, it was 8% a year. And um, that was due overwhelmingly to the highly competitive exchange rate, which the devaluation uh, did, because uh, we devalued, of course, against the dollar as well. And the Republic of Ireland uh, does two thirds of its trade outside the Eurozone in terms of looking at the trade composition of the Republic. We're in the Eurozone, but we do only one third of our trade with the other 16 states in the Eurozone. We do roughly a third of our trade, trade the exports and imports together with the United Kingdom, and a third with America and the rest of the world. So we join the Eurozone, even though we do nearly two thirds of our trade, some 60% or so now, outside the zone. Why do we do that? Well, again, you must come back to the critical uh, 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 euphilia of our political elite. The, our politicians did so on this something. The British were going to join it in a year or two. So we joined the Eurozone in 1999, locked the currency exchange rates together. Coincidentally, for the first two or three years experience of the Eurozone, the Euro went down vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the United States dollar. And this increased our competitiveness for two or three years. So the core, uh, uh, the fundamental cause of the high economic growth of the market in the late 90s and early 2000s was the highly competitive exchange rate. But then, of course, the euro began to rise, and we began to see some of the drawbacks of our membership. Um, traditionally, Irish banks only borrow, borrow very little from, from abroad, but now, of course, as part of the eurozone, they could borrow from German, British, and French, uh, British, German, German, French, uh, Portuguese, and Spanish banks, because they were all part of the euro, and they began doing that at a great rate. Uh, moreover, interest rates, we had a boom in the late 90s because of the high economic growth rate, uh, and uh, uh, on joining the Eurozone, of course, we more than half interest rates. We got a total super interest rate regime because the interest rate regime for the Eurozone is set by reference to what suits the majority of the population of the Eurozone, primarily France and Germany, which constitutes half the population of the Eurozone. And so we, even though we had a boom, we more than half interest rates, we started borrowing abroad at a great rate, 
And uh, of course, the, 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 the boom became boomier, to use the expression uh, of, of a former uh, teacher, Bertie Herman. And uh, we had one of the world's biggest asset bubbles, a property bubble. Instead of uh, concentrating on exports, we concentrated more and more on the domestic, domestic sea, particularly on the property area. And we had one of the greatest <coughs> property bubbles anywhere in terms of rise in house prices. And the banks borrowed left, right, and center, not only from Irish depositors, but massively abroad to finance on lending to the Irish property market. And that was the situation that happened in, in, roughly from 2002 and 3, culminating in 2004, 5, 6, and then, of course, the property bubble burst in 2007. And that, of course, meant that the, the, we found that some of the Irish banks were, were, were in, effectively insolvent. They borrowed massively from abroad for on lending to the Irish property market. They'd um, now had huge debts to foreign banks. And uh, the, the, the property which they borrowed to finance uh, was falling in value. And so uh, one bank, in particular Anglo-Irish bank, uh, which was virtually exclusively a developer's bank, also had borrowed some 30 billion uh, from uh, German, British and French banks in that order of importance for our lending of the Irish property market. It was in no sense systemic. Uh, and it uh, should have been left go bust, which would of course hit the foreign banks which it had borrowed. But one of the consequences of being in the Eurozone is that you take your instructions to the European Central Bank. And um, the Irish government, uh, the leadership of the time, Brian Cowan, and the Prime Minister, and the Finance Minister, Mr. Linehan, guaranteed, uh, gave a blanket guarantee to the Irish banks that not only would the Irish state stand over uh, its dep dep depositors, those who put their savings in Irish banks, but they would, would stand over the uh, bondholders and creditors, those who would lend to the Irish banks uh, and the people from whom the Irish banks had borrowed. Most of them, foreign banks, German, British and French banks in that order, of importance in the context of, of um, Anglo-Irish and so on. So this blanket guarantee, in effect, shifted the burden of repaying the bad debts of the Irish banks onto the, uh, shift that part onto the backs of Irish taxpayers. In the case of Anglo-Irish, a bank alone, some 30 billion was taken on board by the Irish taxpayers, uh, and uh, in the case of other banks, huge, huge sums as well. And this was added to the big, uh, the normal big deficit of which the Irish government had, had built up during the 2000s, and meant that we have, have this colossal public debt. So now, uh, we are in effect being run, the Irish state being run by the Troika, of the European Central Bank, the Brussels Commission, and the IMF in tow. Uh, and uh, we have borrowed a huge sums of money in order to essentially pay off the, well, cover our own public sector deficit, of course, which is something like 10% equivalent to 10% of GDP, but also pay the, 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 the debts of the, uh, of the Irish banks, which are largely owing to, to foreign banks. And a some, some, somewhat similar situation exists in relation to Greece. So that was. Why, at one level, I, I, I'm a happy man, it's a very unhappy situation with the Republic of Ireland, but the Irish people are discovering the hard way of, of the drawbacks of the membership of the Eurozone. It was an act, an, act, an act of criminal folly, of total governmental irresponsibility of the Irish state to join the Eurozone, when it did. The politicians did so, they saw that the British were going to join as well, and then two-thirds of our trade would be with the Eurozone. Instead, nearly two-thirds of our trade is outside the Eurozone. All the other Eurozone states do half or more of their trade with one another. We do the greater part outside it with the United Kingdom, uh, America, and the rest of the world. So that uh, sterling falls in relation to the Euro, and as the Euro goes up, and as the dollar falls, of course, this hits Irish exports and makes it more difficult for us in all sorts of ways. We've got a, a fall in the output of the Irish economy, some 10% in the last few years. The current rate of unemployment is 15%, and of course, it's pretty much higher right now for the resumption of significant net emigration abroad. Uh, during the boom of the 90s, you had immigration, more people coming into the country, now it's the other way. Uh, our national debt is around 100% of GDP, our governmental debt is about 100% of GDP. But it's worth noting, and I just draw this statistic to, 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 to mind, that if you add together, and this has been done recently, the Government debt, the private debt, and the uh, company debt, total debt in other words, uh, the public bond has the highest debt in the world, 
some five times its, its annual income. Whereas Greece, if you add together Greece, Greek, the Greek state's debt, its private person's debt, and its company debt is two and a half times Greek's, de Greek's GDP. In the case of the United States of America, something like three times. In the case of the United Kingdom, the combined debt of the state sector, the private sector, personal debt, and, and, and business is, is um, in the case of the United Kingdom, it's, um, uh, I haven't got here, but I think it's about three times. But in the case of the, uh, of Ireland, it's five times. And of course, ultimately, it's the citizens must meet these debts. They, they meet the state debt by through taxation. They meet uh, personal debt, of course, through mortgage payments and credit card payments and so on. And of course, they meet uh, company debts through, through prices and the price they have to pay for goods. So we're in a very, very bad situation. The export sector of the Irish economy, which is uh, quite important in manufacturing exports, we've got a thriving and healthy manufacturing sector, largely foreign companies in Ireland. And uh, but they employ about 7% of the labor force, uh, they're highly capital intensive, they're doing reasonably well at the moment. But the domestic sector is flat, uh, and the people are burdened with extraordinary debts. There's uh, harsh budgets. Uh, we've had two or three, we're going to have several more. Uh, the, People will be crucified uh, with, with mortgages because there's uh, huge, huge numbers of people with negative equity that they bought houses at the top of the market and, and of course the, the, the real value has fallen and they have to meet the original debts. So, so the situation in the public world is extremely, is extremely uh, miserable. And that's why of course there's a huge reaction against, uh, against the, the EU and against the Eurozone. The people don't like being ordered around or in effect having their policies in detail decided by the Troika of the European Central Bank, the IMF, and the European Commission, who in effect uh, are running the show in detail uh, in, in the polygon, as they are doing in Greece and in Portugal, and maybe doing down the road uh, elsewhere. I, I did a very extensive paper on, on the Eurozone and the Republic of Ireland, and then passed it around there. There's some 12 pages. I don't know if there's enough copies for everybody. I don't think there are. But uh, there's more detailed information on the Republic situation on pages 6 to 10 of that paper. Uh, but we did, of course, uh, the Irish people have been getting more European with the years. They said no to the Treaty of Nice in 2001. They said no to the Treaty of Lisbon in 2008, but of course they were made to re, re-vote, or vote a second time on exactly the same treaty by the powers that be. And in the case of the Treaty of Lisbon, they were, they were bullied very much, and, and of course the economic situation is significantly downturned have the secret second Lisbon referendum. But the new situation is making, making the Irish economy really extremely Euro critical. There's absolutely no doubt about that. All sorts of people who economists and others who, who you know went along with this project uh, for years are now uh, you know saying it was a terrible mistake to join the Eurozone and so on. But the Irish government is determined if at all possible to avoid any more referendums. And of course the big development, the most alarming development, and I just want to conclude on this point now is that France and Germany have realized they can't really run the 27-state European Union show, but they can try and run the Eurozone show of 17 states. And uh, the Germans particularly want to impose, they don't want to transfer union where the, the rich areas would be, or the rich states would be giving large sums of money to the, to, to the poor. They want to, to re-establish the strict system of, of rules uh, which uh, were originally supposed to accompany the, uh, the single currency, maximum deficit in any one year of 3% of GDP, uh, uh, maximum national debt of 60% of GDP. Of course, all the states broke these rules, and when France and Germany broke them in 2003, uh, well then they, they, they were put in abeyance, but now they want to move back to those, and to have automatic fines imposed on those who might break these rules down the road. And that is why, of course, they want to have a new inner group Eurozone within the, in fact, they want to divide the EU between the ins and the outs. And Merkel and Sarkozy have been quite frank on that uh, ambition in, in the recent period. This could be the beneficial crisis whereby they could turn the monetary union into uh, a tax union, a budget union, a fiscal union, and a political union with France and Germany running the show. Because, of course, under the Lisbon Treaty, from 2014, the voting system for making laws on the European Union is put on a population basis, which will more than double Germany's effective voting weight and increase uh, France's by some 50%, which is currently 8% to 12 So they, they want a new treaty 
At present, we heard this morning about the European uh, Financial Stability Fund, the EFSF, which is the temporary bailout fund that was set up to help Greece last year, and for which Ireland has bothered and Portugal has bothered, and which they're still fiddling around with. But that was a three year fund meant to uh, end, end next year. What the Eurozone wants to establish is a permanent fund to come into being in, in, in 2013. And for that, they have signed, and they agreed last July, the ESM Treaty, the European Stability Mechanism Treaty, which uh, was signed between the 17 states of the Eurozone last July. But in order to sign it, they had to get permission from the 27 uh, European Union states, including from Britain, and Mr. George Osborne, uh, and the Ireland Arms Finance Minister, Mr. Noonan, and the others, uh, have agreed to give that permission. So, in order to, for the Eurozone to establish this special uh, treaty among themselves, which established a very big fund down the road from 2013 with the possibility of raising it uh, by easy steps thereafter, and uh, the European Commission would be drawn into the running of it, and any disputes in relation to it would be subject to the judgments of the European Court of Justice. These are all elements in the European Stability Mechanism Treaty. That's among the 17, but for the 17 to do that, they had to get permission from the 27. And to get permission from the 27, it takes an amendment of the mass to the, the treaties, the European Union treaties, as amended by the Treaty of Lisbon, and uh, amendments specifically to Article 136 uh, of the treaties, which allows the 17 to set up a special uh, mechanism, the European Stability Mechanism, among themselves with all their own rules. And an amendment to the European Union treaties, of course, normally it would, would be a big issue, you'd have a big conference and so on, but under the Treaty of Lisbon, the so-called self-amending article of the Treaty of Lisbon, Article 48.6, um, the European Council of Prime Ministers and Presidents can amend any aspect of the treaty as long as it doesn't increase the powers of the European Union as such. And the argument is that this special treaty on the 17 doesn't increase the powers of the European Union. It only increases the powers or gives powers to the 17. And it's an intergovernmental treaty among themselves. And therefore, it doesn't increase the powers of the EU. Therefore, it can't be regarded in the Republic of Ireland as requiring a referendum. And this is quite cleverly done because they are, otherwise the, the, the referendum would be required in the Republic of Ireland normally. Any accession of powers to the EU requires a referendum there. And of course, the Irish people would certainly not be uh, willing at the moment, certainly, uh, to say yes to any referendum in view of their current harsh experiences. But uh, so far as I know, no state has yet ratified the, the ESM treaty. It's been signed by the finance ministers on July the 11th last. There'll be very little discussion about it. There's a lot of concern about the ESFSS, the, the, the European Financial Stability Fund, the temporary bailout fund, and that was enlarged and amended a bit uh, in, uh, in July. But um, the permanent fund is really very important. And it will come before the British Parliament and the other parliaments for, for, for ratification, ratification due course. Not the, the, not the ESM treaty, which is for the 17, and you're not one of the Eurozone members, but you have to give permission as a member of the EU. And uh, it really seems to me that this is something which uh, we're very desirable and should be made more of in British politics. But why should the, the because this is the mechanism which the French and the Germans want to use to develop a new inner group with a fiscal union, harmonized taxation, the end of Ireland's and half percent corporation tax, which is the main incentive we have for attracting foreign capital to Ireland. All that is on the table through this fiscal union, so-called, uh, tax harmonization and so on, which would be for the Eurozone states. And it seems to be very unfortunate that Mr. George Osborne is saying, is urging the states of the Eurozone to go towards a fiscal union. I mean, why should he wish such a fate on, on, on the citizens of the Republic of Ireland, on, on the citizens of, uh, of the other, of the other um, Eurozone states? It's very unfortunate. And uh, I think it's very serious if the, if the uh, member states of the EU or the governments of the, of the EU states that are, are outside the Eurozone, such as Britain or Sweden or Denmark or Poland or the Czech Republic, if they're willing to amend the treaties or allow an amendment to the treaties, which would permit this subgroup, the 17, to do all sorts of things among themselves, that there's no provision which says that what they do must be compatible with existing treaties. You'd have thought that would be required, but it's not. So uh, that is the prospect now opening up that the 
Merkel and Sarkozy will try and make this a beneficial crisis, will try and use it to push the Eurozone towards closer integration. More under the thumb, of course, of, of Franco Germany, of Germany with France holding on to its coattails, uh, with automatic fines for breaches of the rules, with pushes towards harmonized taxes, and so on and so forth. So, and, and that is extremely worrying in the Council of the Republic of Ireland. It would, of course, draw further division between the South and North of Ireland, but apart from, from, from any other uh, effects. And so I think that is a matter of considerable concern. In conclusion, there's no doubt, as, as has been said by so many here, that the, that the Eurozone is an abortion. It's uh, falling asunder, not because of its opponents, not because of the strength of its critics, but because of its own inherent contradictions and conflicts. That's obvious enough. It's, it was irrational from the beginning. I would say in the Republic of Ireland, the majority of Irish economists were against it. Uh, at least as long as the United Kingdom wasn't, wasn't in it, because as I said earlier, we do most of our trade outside the, uh, outside the Eurozone. And it's been totally uh, unsuitable for us. We were now stuck with it. It's, it's, it's like trying to unscramble an omelette. I mean, I, I don't think the Eurozone will hold together. Some states will leave. It's highly desirable that the Republic of Ireland will leave. But uh, at the moment, our government is hoping that if they're the good boys in Europe, if they practice austerity, if they uh, tighten their belts further, have further public spending cuts, further rise in taxation, that they will get some remission of the huge debts they have to pay down the road. That is the current stance of the Republic's government. But uh, I, I don't think that the, I think that these are very naive views, uh, and that therefore uh, we should welcome the uh, statement which I gather was issued by the Bruges Group yesterday that what's desirable is a manageable and orderly dismantling of the Eurozone in the interests of the countries within it and without it. Thank you.